You get yourself ready. I got, I got, got myself all prettied up. <laughs> you should know I have zero shame. <laughs> Let's get into it. One, two, three. Well, welcome to my whiskey den, and as you can see, we're going to be looking at Jay Riger's private stock, where it is finished in a Pedo Noir uh, barrel. Pretty fantastic. Thanks for dropping in, folks. <laughs> Lovely to see your faces <laughs> as you're looking at ours. Anyway, be sure to do all the good stuff. Like, click, subscribe, hit that bell to make sure you get the notifications. You know, all the proper things you hear on YouTube. Just do the thing. Thanks for coming. And we'll kick it over to Mike since this is coming from Kansas City. He gets to be the Rambler today. <laughs> the Kansas City Rambler. So, all right, this is uh, Jacob Rieger. There's a brief history here, or try to make it brief, but it's extremely interesting. Uh, so, he immigrated to America in 1877 and uh, originally started in Cincinnati, moved on to Kansas City, and opened a grocery store. So, about 10 years later, he started a new venture, which was making booze. And he founded uh, Jay Rieger and Company in the Kansas City West Bottoms, which is uh, in the near the old livestock exchange. So the interesting thing about that area is it's it's right on the Missouri Kansas border, and uh, Kansas had already en enacted their own prohibition in 1881. So all the Kansans would come over and hang out in this whole area. It had so many saloons, brothels, casinos, uh, and liquor <laughs> liquor retailers that it was called uh, the the wettest block in the world. And, uh, and I assure you, everyone over there, they knew which was Kansas and which was Missouri. And it was this was pre-Chiefs, uh, but it was pretty easy to tell which side you were on. So uh, anyway, a few years later, uh, Jacob turned the operation over to his son, who was a pretty savvy businessman, and he started doing mail order. And Jay Rieger was the largest mail order whiskey house in the, in the United States, and that was up until Prohibition. So um, – when they were facing the, the shutdown, uh, which was effective January 1st, 1920, uh, he decided, all right, we're just going to shut down in December. But he had, um, this is the Rieger private stock we're going over. So, but he had come up with an idea because he knew that they were going to shut down. And uh, so Alexander Rieger had, because uh, <laughs> prohibition, they, it, it was illegal to sell, but not possess or consume it. So uh, he had gotten with a federal judge uh, and he had said, hey, look, uh, I've got the legal right to keep all this booze. And so if I move the, all the bottles that are in the inventory to my home, you know, and the federal judge is like, yeah, good idea. <laughs> so that's where the term uh, private stock came from. And so he uh, that's when they revived this this uh, single barrel program uh, or barrel selection program they called it private stock after that because he got to keep his booze he didn't have to give it away and, and i thought that was a great move and not only did he he keep that he also threw parties with it so when he came over it was a really big deal yes for i, I know the judge had, had to the, who favored with him had <laughs> shown up at one of the parties as well yeah um, but for for all the the hoi toysies in the area and everyone stopping over he could have a party with it and not get in trouble as well too, because it was all his own private stock. So, exactly. So, um, so the Rieger name it had it, it stuck around, and the Rieger Hotel, which was a uh, south part of downtown Kansas City, uh, was still there, and um, all the Rieger businesses were long gone, but the Rieger Hotel had remained. And so around it was around 2010. There was a bartender at uh, at a bar that was in that old hotel, um, who had said, "Man, it, it'd be really cool to kind of revive that name." So he starts the, um, I'm trying to remember what they called it. It was basically, well, it was the, you know, the Rieger, Ho the Rieger Hotel, so, so called, I think. Um, then uh, it was, I'm trying to remember his name, and uh, Andy Rieger. I think he was the last remaining named Rieger uh, who had come uh, to that the, around the grand opening. And they started talking and it was like, well, I'm a Rieger. And he's like, well, I think we should, you know, do something here. And it was about four years later. They got the, the old trademark back. Um, they found a historian that had a bunch of old bottles and uh, some of the old paraphernalia. Because one of the things that Rieger did with the mail order was they sold shot glasses and all kinds of other stuff. And they, you know, on their, their website, they said this referred, this is like the earliest uh, spam mail because they would spam a lot of people's mailboxes with their stuff. 
Um, but when they, and when they started this in 2014, they wanted to do it right. And they wanted to do something to how the, you know, the old whiskey was blended and they got none other than, uh, Dave Pickerel to come and help them. And that created the, uh, Rieger's Kansas city whiskey, uh, which is a blend of, of sourced corn whiskey, sourced rye whiskey, and 15 year old Oloroso sherry. And, um, that right now Rieger is making their own whiskey, but they're not selling the whiskey that they are making yet. It is on the edge of being sold. It's like 3.5 years old, I think ish. Um, but they've moved into a new facility, um, about a year ago. Um, really nice facility from where they're at and they've been making their own stock. So we're looking really forward to having some of their original stuff coming up. Um, and like we said, this was a single barrel, Pro, or a barrel pick program. Sorry, it's not a single barrel. Barrel pick program, and this is from a local liquor chain in Kansas City called Gomer's. And this was finished in uh, Pinot Noir casks from the, I think it's from the Ayers, Ayers Winery. Um, and uh, I believe it's six to seven years old is what the, what the age is on it. And uh, so I'm ready to uh, shut up and uh, stick my nose in here. And before we go one ounce further, or sniff, smell, ounce, drink, anything. I want to thank the benefactor. Oh, yes. Our, our, our benefactor today was our, Mr. Stephen Andrew Card, a.k.a. the commissioner. Big Steve. <laughs> Big Steve, the commissioner. Yes. We can't thank you enough for helping us get a, get this. Cheers uh, to Steve. Get this out to Ben. And, wait, we'll, however it showed up in Ben's hands, it showed up in Ben's hands. And we, want to, we, we want to thank you for... <laughs> for helping us get a chance to taste this kind of special selection. What are you guys getting on the nose? Oh, hold on here. Let me get her up here. Kind of similar to the last one, a little bit darker, not as ambery, yeah. kind of like an orangey-ish, kind of orangey-ish amber color. It's a little oily too. Yeah. It's got some Ooh. good legs to it. Yeah. 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 There's a this. slight pink, pinkish red tone to it, I think, from the wine cask. Yep, yeah. yep, I can see that in there too. But yeah, the oil goes up, it collects, comes down, it's got legs, it doesn't just fade away. It takes two to three seconds before it starts coming down, but it does kind of almost make the glass look like a Christmas ornament as I'm spinning it around. Yeah, it's Ooh. red fruit jam. Yes. And, a, and I can, the wine's on like the back third or back fourth of the nose for me. That's where I kind of get that light, that Pinot Noir kind of pick up on the on the on the flavor or on the scent. You get a little bit of a dusty corn grain. What's it? Oh, that's exactly where I was gonna go. I was gonna go. This is uh, fifty percent alcohol by volume. But yeah, I was gonna say I wouldn't want to say musty, but dusty is right. Um, but it's a little sharp too. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's. Yeah, it's. It's not musty funk, but it is dusty. But like you said, it's got a sharp the tail end where the peanut where the wine comes in. I think is kind of has a sharp edge to it. Yeah. But it does have like a little bit of a bright effervescent nose to it. This is this is already not the nose of the normal uh, normal release that I'm used to. No. Um, this is lightened and kind of. Uh, softened on the dark rich notes that i get off the normal one i'd almost hmm. say uh like a candied orange a little bit yeah yeah can't can, yeah you, you mentioned the jam and yeah the candied orange it's very it's very uh pastry filling forward that's one that i i know rigor the standard Skull. kansas city whiskey is really it, it's really nice but I, I know some people, and I don't want to say complain, but they're like, ah, oh, I don't know. But they're talking about comparing it to a bourbon. It's not a bourbon. Right. It's an it's an American whiskey, and it's Kansas City style whiskey, so it's different and has a different base to it. This this isn't a wine finished bourbon. This isn't a wine no. finished rye. I mean, this is this is a blended whiskey that's that's wine finished, and so there's some really unique flavors. This is kind of like uh, we were talking with Kinnickinick from Great Lakes where they have that and then they'll finish it in a cab barrel or something. But it's it started off as a blend, not yeah, not the bourbon you were you were kind of looking at. All right, I got to go in. For the nose of me, is almost like a few different scones that have like fruit filling in it. Like a couple different types where you're getting a little bit of bread, but you're getting like this 
two or three different kind of like a little bit of jam flavors just like you mentioned this red berry kind of strong but i'm getting like it's like an apricot or like a little lemon filling on one of them jam on toasted rye bread mm. okay i'll get in i'll get i'll stop drinking too you don't have to twist my arm too hard wow yeah that the 50 percent proof it's not playing around no no that's in there and not as yeah. alcoholic but like it has no. some heat and a little bit of punch to, a little bit of punch to it it's not like slapping you around no but you can feel it in there like yeah it's, i'm i got a little bit of heat going down when i swallowed it yeah it's just like this is an apparent we did not make this at 40 percent. right <laughs> yeah there's there's no bones about it it's got and some it, nice heat to it yeah and it's not bad it's not a bad thing at all no that's really nice let you know it's there okay <laughs> Which i gotta say it's probably a good thing because in some ways, as delicious as whiskey is, if it was a lower proof and a lot smoother, it, this would be really dangerous to drink. <laughs> I kind of like, I, I, I feel like where the rye, where the heat picks up, like say like some alcohol heat picks up, it's the same time that like the rye, that, like the rye flavor kicks up, then the pinot spikes, and then they all kind of fade together in the tail end of it. Yeah, when they start fading away. You're getting a nice barrel note on the finish. Hmm. Yeah, there's a little and bit of barrel on the finish. sides. The pinot's on the yeah. sides of my tongue. I I would be afraid of this at a lower proof, not not just because I think it would be dangerous. Whoo! Danger! 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 Unbelievable. But I think, uh, I think the the subtleties of the whiskey and the wine. I mean, even though it's it's uh, it's a nice blend. I'm afraid that would get lost. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it might, it might be, I don't want to say uninteresting, but it might just be, eh, there's a blended whiskey. It was finished. And I, I think that the higher proof was a really good choice. I think it complements it. I love the sweet jammy notes of the, the, that yeah. the wine is imparting and how that balances with the spiciness of the rye, the, the pepperiness yeah. that kicks in. I, I, yeah. It's like a first chair violin player that drives a monster truck. <laughs> it's got some class, but he's not messing around. Right. Kind of thinking of that when when the symphony is due like Metallica. Yes. You know, like the you can. But maybe a better band. Maybe, but <laughs> you can pick a different one. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just remembering what they have done that way. Um, Motorhead. Yeah, the first half is a little bit of bread some jam it's a little bit lighter not not super oily on on the on the tongue um but then yeah that and that's and that's nice and smooth and light and then all of a sudden like you hit that section where it's heat and rye spice and escalation and yes. it kind of comes down after you get the pinot side like on the sides of your tongue it kind of comes down and fades the barrel note comes in at the end uh towards the end more so kind of once the heat all kicks in it kind of it has more flavor than it does barrel note for me like the barrel note is hidden behind the flavors like uh, it's definitely not playing center stage um in this whiskey for me hmm. there's a little bit of earthiness in there i'm going to say probably from the wine and maybe the corn a little bit and i'm getting a little bit of a nutty nutty maybe like a walnut note to it Yeah, I've got a, a caramelized fruit with nuts is one of the things I was I was getting with it. Yeah, on mm -hmm. the finish, it's just it's it's like a yeah a a, a well married, a well married flavor. I'm giving I'm giving Gomer's credit because this is a, a unique pick and finish mm -hmm. from with a standard release. Yeah, this is I don't want to say a sharp left turn. Uh, it's kind of like J. Henry and Son. Where you have the normal five year or five year cast strength, and then you go to the Bella Fontaine that's finished in cognac casks, the flavor pulls it's just it's just like pulls it like a far left. Like it's just yeah. almost brings it into another category for what it's doing. Cause this I think it hides the Oloroso sherry that's in the blend with yep. the Pinot and the other notes, but it is still in there hiding underneath right. stuff, giving you some of those like sweet berry flavors and the red berry notes underneath, but it is hidden away compared to the normal release. Yeah. 
It's like like cooking something where you have you have an ingredient that masks another one but not hides another ingredient. Does it's a compliment, but it's like all right, what is? It? I can't pick out that thing, and then you're oh, right. that's it's got this in it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. No, it's this is uh, it's pretty well done. It's it, it's de- it's definitely a unique one. Um, I don't know what the price point is on it, but I'm guessing under a hundred. You know, I'm you know maybe yeah. I want I, I'm guessing to 50, to, fifty to sixty bucks. I think. Oh, well, for then for, for that, it's it's pretty. Impressive. I could be wrong, but for a fifty sixty bucks, I I really kind of yeah. kind of dig this. This is one where it's it's gotten me going back again, kind of like the Baum Brothers one, where it's it has me going back to the glass to look for things to hunt for them and keep to keep expecting and exploring it yeah so on on that note they did a wonderful job because you yeah my brain keeps spinning with it like am i getting all the flavors is what what am i getting i I still feel like i'm missing a little bit something on the front end of it um or something that i can't peg in the flavor profile yeah there it's a little bit tannic on the finish as well Mm -hmm. and there's a, a kind of finishes off on the sour on the sour side of things the tart and sour mm-hmm. side of things uh, but there there's a note of um i'm trying to figure out of a pipe tobacco but it's a specific type of pipe tobacco and i'm trying to nail down exactly what it is that i'm getting in there on the finish i, I think it's kind of more tied in with the barrel char but for mm-hmm. me it's coming across as a as a kind of a pipe tobacco I see that i can definitely see that you're getting that because it is a little bit of like burntness a little bit of charcoal a little bit of like you said pipe tobacco not an expert in that so i go yeah, i would, I would put it as, as a as a black cavendish pipe tobacco right in that right in that territory okay hiding in the background yeah um other than the pickup of the heat and the, and the kind of the rye spice and stuff at that point very very smooth and well married together not a lot of other sharp notes than that like that's when it like escalates and kind of brings some, a little excitement to when you're drinking it. But then it fades away pretty quick as far as like the heat or aggressive notes. Um, so very well kind of put together from beginning to end on this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so they're doing this makes me excited for the new stuff that's coming out. If I wasn't before. Yeah. It seemed the way they manipulate other barrels and doing stuff like that. As to as to what they can do or where their goals are going to be, I'm I'm intrigued with the uh, bourbon and I think rye that they're doing. So yeah. it, it, we'll get to taste those uh, next month or so. You know, and whenever we have them on, we're working on it. Yeah. Uh, it, it I think everyone will be excited about for when those come out because I know they have been, and as a company. Um, during this whole pandemic thing, they did a very good job of keeping everyone on staff the whole time. If I'm not yeah, right, I, I was just I was just gonna say that that's one you know like so many distilleries jumped up and they were they're making hand sanitizer at, at at a loss to them because of you know some really stupid government rules um, you know but they they jumped in like so many people but they were um, getting rid of the hand sanitizer and it was like you know hey it's kind of it was kind of pay what you can when they were first going through is taking donations Mm -hmm. obviously donating a lot to the to the first responders uh and then they they're they're still selling it uh but they kept i and i do believe they kept all their employees throughout this um and and that's 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 very fortunate because not everybody was able to do that I, I think uh, there's some to their philosophy. I think the uh, other thing is to the community is how the community rallied around them. Uh, but it's uh, with their new distillery, which like I said, I have not been up there uh, to see it yet. Um, it looks really awesome. <laughs> it, lo- it looks it looks really good. And they, they, they seem to be on a, on a very good path for longevity. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I am excited to talk to them and, and, uh, and see where they're going to go next with their with their stuff. And then with where they picked their distillery, kind of a little more downtown ish, um, I think it was like the Power District or something like that. Where they it, used... was, it was, well, the old one was more downtown. This one is more in the, right. the East Bottoms, um, where there is a lot of warehouses and stuff. Um, but kind of, you know, a lot of old old buildings that need to be redone. And they, they did a wonderful job. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really cool. I mean, go to the website, look it up, look at some of the pictures of it. Uh, follow them on Facebook and, and they're, they're pretty good about their posts. Uh, 
showing pictures of the of the the uh, the new facility, um, selling a lot of uh, pre-made cocktails and and uh, they always have happy hour events and other stuff. It's very they're very engaged in their surroundings. And if you've been there, and they they actually have a whole section of the distillery that is set as like a historical, like a his like a history way, where the tour guide will take you through what happened starting way back when. Uh, and they have pictures, like you said, Mike, they found someone who had like leftover stuff, memorabilia, and they brought that all in. So part of the tour and part of the building they sectioned off as kind of like this historical aspect to what happened to bring you up to where it is today. Yeah. And after you've had a few drinks at the tasting, they have a slide. I mean, not many of the places. If you had a few drinks, you know, in slides can be kind of fun. So, I, that, you know, they're playing with some extra stuff just, you know, to like enhance it a little bit. Um, and I think more more adults use it than uh, than the kids that might tag along probably. for for the lunch and brunch stuff that they have there. They're probably um, cleaning it with the heads and tails, to make sure everything's yep, sanitary. Yep. <laughs> yep. I'll but, throw this uh, in real quick: a few yeah. drops of water, and it really tamps down the fruitiness. Yeah, and it brings the oak and the uh, the grain, more of the corn and the rye, more to the forefront. So. Just when you have time, yeah, give that a try. I, I, I did. I did that while somebody was rambling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah really I get more of a candy out. flavor. Yeah. But I lose what type of berries and what type of fruit it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I a good choice at the fifty. Gomer, excellent choice at the fifty. Wait, wait, to, wait to pick that. Way to pick that uh, ABV on that. Um, and on that note, I think that's good for us. We yeah. will end up seeing you next week. What's going on here when we release this? I think coming up next, we're going to be having Nancy Fraley on. I mean, it's a total excitement here. A little, little I don't know anyone else can tell. Huh? Um, uh, she, she, someone's <laughs> a master blender. Um, She's my crush. Yeah, and <laughs> where, where, where this had Dave Pickerel, and he gets a, a ton of love and respect for being kind of Johnny Appleseed for a lot of kind of craft distilleries. Uh, I feel like Nancy, person that goes to places that were already doing, you know, good, and she's the one that will help them make great or outstanding. You know, like yeah. you, you're making something really good that's excellent that a lot of people like. Once she steps in, like that gets twisted up. You know, like there's there's a release that gets turned up four notches that, you know, garners almost national attention, and that it's that quality that that what she does, and so, uh, I, yeah, a little check. Like I said before, a little arm hairs are standing up. I got that goosebumps rolling, <laughs> um, because just just to be able to, you know, probe her mind about what she's been through, and maybe you know, like her tasting method, how she goes into stuff. I'm really excited about because she helps a ton of people. I don't know how many she can say she helps, but I could think of 10 off the top of my head right now. And yeah. that's a lot of work uh, to, to be doing stuff like that. So we're excited about having her on. So thank you, Stephen, the benefactor on this episode. Yeah. This was a lovely trip. Steve. <laughs> It, it, it was really great. Yeah. This, this is one that was, that was worth definitely yeah. getting. We, we really appreciate it. Um, so remember, it's not the size of the den that matters. It's the love of whiskey, everybody. Cheers. 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 Let's get into it. One, two, three. Just give some more.